Hi there, Lindsay here, The Frugal Crafter. Today I am unboxing a new set of watercolors. They haven't even hit the stores yet. And um, yeah, I'm gonna be one of the first people to share it with you. And probably when this goes live, the listing will be up on Amazon. I'll have a chance to use it for a few weeks. So um, by the time this review goes up, you'll be able to hear all about it so you'll know what you get yourself into. <laughs> you never know with uh, with new stuff. Um, so this was sent to me by Paul Rubens. They asked me if I would try their new set of watercolors. Um, they're the fourth generation artist watercolors. They're supposed to be mostly single, single pigments, pure color, have uh, more like movement in water. They're just supposed to be the best they've ever come out with. And I really like Paul Rubin's stuff, with the exception of their opaque watercolors. I thought those missed the mark a little bit, but um, I'm really excited to see these because I love their regular watercolors, both in tube and pan form. So we're going to take a look at this. They also sent some paper uh, with this so that I would have something to work on. I sliced my finger on uh, some pottery <laughs> earlier today, so I apologize for the band-aid wrapped in washi tape, but you know, the show must go on, as they say. So I'm not sure if this is the glitter paper or not. It kind of looks like it. Um, uh, let's see, I need my scissors, let's just take a look here and see what they sent. I've used the glitter paper, I really like it, it's not really glittery on camera, it's kind of glittery in real life, but I think once you frame it, it kind of loses a lot of the glitteriness, I think that might be what we have here. Again, I haven't been um, disappointed with Paul Rubin's paper either, so if you're looking for a less expensive cotton watercolor paper. I recommend them. I like their hot press paper because it's a little bit more textured than say like the Arches hot press which is super smooth. So a little recommendation if you want one. Now this looks like loose sheets and yes it is the glitter paper and it looks like it's cold press. So if I, I don't know if that you'll catch that in the light or not but I do enjoy this paper. Um, the glitter is is pretty in person. It's not overwhelming, and um, I it's kind of a little gimmicky, but I like the paper. The paper's nice. I don't think it needs the glitter, <laughs> but I don't think it does. I don't think it hurts anything either. Um, you're not going to be like, wow, look at that glitter. It's very very subtle. I think if you had it behind glass, you wouldn't even really notice it either. But. I believe this is still available for sale on Amazon. It should be anyway. That's why they send me the stuff because it's coming out on Amazon. Uh, and this was sent to me from Paul Rubens. So I just want to let you know that I did not purchase this. I don't even know how much these are going to go for. So we'll also have to keep that in mind because I'm going to I'm going to have this video done before it's available for sale. So uh, that's something to just be aware of. It's hard. It's hard to say what a. a a set of watercolors should go for because I've tried watercolors that are, you know, a couple bucks a tube all the way up to, you know, twenty, thirty dollars a tube. There's there's a huge variety. So there's a nice matte black box with gold writing. Artist watercolor. My passion comes from the heavens, not from earthly musings. Um, I'm not sure where they get the the uh, st the the verbiage for their boxes. It's always a little bit um, a little bit unique. And they've got their new their new logo. Instead of it looking like, um, I think maybe they changed it because their logo used looked a lot like the Van Gogh logo. It was like a little portrait of Paul Rubens, Peter Paul Rubens, a painter. Uh, they've changed it to an eyeball with a circle around it. So um, they probably did that just to make it a, make sure people knew the difference. Um, and then we've got a brochure here with swatches and pigment codes. So that's nice, there's pigment codes here with the swatches. Um, it looks like there's more than 36 colors here. Let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Let me be 21, 28. Yeah, there's more than 36. I can't do that much math. And there's light fast ratings on there, transparency information, color codes, and pigment information. So it does look like a lot of these colors are single pigment in this range, the fourth generation range. And it's interesting that they're going with more of a, um, a diffusing paint, a paint that's going to move a little bit more. Think of like, when you think of diffusibility, when you think of a color that, a brand that really diffuses as well, I would say like a core, that paint just goes crazy when you set it in a wet wash. Um, other ones that don't diffuse as well would be like Mission Gold and Shinhan. They tend to have, I think, less oxcall or no oxcall in them. So here we've got a beautiful collection of paints. These look to be about eight milliliters. Let's see if it says, no, five milliliters. That looks like a 
They look a little bit bigger than 5 ml tubes to me, but we've got 36 5 ml tubes. And what I think I'm going to do is put them in some half pans. I've got a uh, little palette here my friend Rosie had made, and she shared some of her paints with me, but I took the, the paints out and put them in a different palette, and I thought this would be nice to use for this. Um, I should label these as we go. Uh, what I think I'll make sure I do is at least put them down in order. Well, I should label the pans first. So the issue I had with the opaque watercolors um, was that when I'd opened them up, they had a lot of binder separation. So I'm hoping that is not what I have here. I'm just looking for a pen I can break with. I wonder if this would be, I might have a finer tip one. What's that one? This, that is not waterproof. Or oh, it's waterproof, but I don't think it's gonna be, it's gonna be safe on. This one might be fine. I think this will probably work. It's like a micron. Hopefully that'll work on plastic. Um, so let's see. Naples yellow. If these are single pigment, then I could just do... Now this is PW6 and PY53, so it's a nickel titanate yellow plus white. Let's see. PW6, P, uh, PY53... I'll put some poster putty or double-sided tape or some the glue dots or something. This might be problematic with my finger here in a band-aid. All right, no binder separation that I can see. A little air bubble in there, but nothing, nothing that would worry me. I wonder if I should also write the name on there. You know what? I think I might. Okay, next time we'll do that beforehand, but I'm just gonna write Naples just so I know. I don't know if I'll do all these today because my finger is taped up, but let's just do a few of these and we'll see. Let's do lemon, this is PY3. Uh, ink dries on there. I'm not sure if it will, to be honest. That looks good. Oh yeah, consistency is nice on these paints. Oh, that's a relief. I was really concerned after the last time. Actually, they might be great for pouring into pans because they, they I'll pull it down a little bit so you can see they level out really well. Actually, I'm, I'm a little, um, I'm feeling good about this because they're small tubes. So sometimes I feel like the companies will come up with these really big tubes, but they are, um, you know, the quality is lower. I'd rather have better quality and less of it. So this is PY33, which should be cadmium yellow. Cadmium yellow light. PY35. Actually, I'm just gonna leave that uncapped. This is this is really good. I'm very pleased that there hasn't been any binder separation yet. I mean, the new paints they shouldn't they shouldn't have any separation, but the uh, the opaque watercolors had some issues. But these look good. All right, I'm gonna carry on in this fashion. If I find some binder separation, I will turn the camera back on and show you. But um, for right now, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go I'm just gonna go ahead and fill these pans. All right, I squeezed out all the paint into tubes uh, into pans. There were no binder binder separation. I was very happy with that. Um, consistency was pretty uniform. The only the stiffer paints I noticed the um, let's see PB26 that is cobalt turquoise dark that was really stiff coming out of the tube. But it, I mean it's fine. It's not hard or anything. Then I noticed like the, I think it was burnt sienna was a little bit stiff, um, just a little bit thicker. I guess not as liquid as the other ones, uh, but no separation whatsoever. A couple 
had like a little air bubble in it, but these are pretty generous 5 ml tubes, so I don't think that any were shorted any paint. I would even say that they almost seem like they have more. I kind of want to grab a, a 5 ml, let's see, this is a Daniel Smith 5 ml tube. Let me just look at the, well, size-wise, I guess they are about the same. Um, okay, they just seemed a little bit bigger, but I guess it's about the same as a, as a Daniel Smith tube. Um, so yeah, so far so good. I saw some unique pigment colors, which I'm kind of excited for. I'm gonna let these dry though, and then I'm gonna swatch them out, and, and uh, what the heck, I'll film the swatching. You guys can skip ahead or watch it or whatnot, but I want this to dry, at least set up overnight before I do that, because I like to work with the paint, dry from pans. I think a lot of us do that. We squeeze our paints out into a palette, we let it dry, and then we work from the dry paint. So it's kind of nice to see how that's gonna, um, that's gonna affect it. Um, a lot of the colors were single pigment. I was excited about that. Oddly enough, and I noticed this with paints that are made in Korea, China, um, more Asian countries, is that Japan, you'll see that they will do weird mixes on their earth tones. And I noticed that like with um, brown umber, that's a mix of PB15 colon 1, PBR7, and PBK9. The Burnt Sienna was a mix of PR101 and PBK9. It's just a little a little strange, and but it seems to be kind of similar. Like this uh, Indian Red is PR101 and PR206. Uh, let's see, it was Venetian Red, that's, that's a single pigment. It was kind of weird. You know, there is some interesting colors. Pier, uh, Paraline Maroon, uh, PR179. I'm not very familiar with that. I always thought that color was a little bit browner, but it looks like it's pretty vibrant. So I'm curious to see how that one looks. I think I only have that in one other brand. Maybe I have it in a couple. I think I only have it in one other ones. But um, but it's kind of it's kind of interesting. Real cadmium colors, which I like. Some people don't, but I do. A lot of cobalt colors in here too. Um, I'm some of the greens are actually. Almost all the greens are mixes, but that doesn't bother me. That's pretty par for the course. One thing I was kind of excited about was um, they use PO62 in their sap in their olive greens in the olive green olive green dark. One of my favorite um, greens is a mixture PO62 and PG7. It was an M gram sap green. Uh, they also have PO62 just on their own too, and I was trying to think if that one was one. I was thinking that one might have been discontinued, but it might be PO74. I can't remember. But anyway, this is all ready to go. I'm just gonna let it dry up. It'll be a day or two, and I'll come back and we'll do some swatching. We'll see uh, how many of these are single pigments. We'll see how they look, and uh, get a better feel for the paints. So far, so good though. Okay, it's about a week later, and um, the paints have dried in their pans. I did swatch them right away just to kind of see what the colors were. I made myself a little color chart here to go in my palette. Um, and then I did a glaze. I didn't notice any issues. The colors were nice and vibrant. They felt great to work with, but I did want to let them dry down the pants to see how they would re-wet. I have not sprayed this or anything, so let's just see how they go. We'll talk about the pigments used. And um, if you're not down with swatching videos, then you can definitely go ahead and you know skip ahead a little bit. So the first color we have is Naples Yellow. Um, I'm going to start it kind of full strength up here, Maybe a little more. Nice and smooth. It's actually fairly transparent. The pigments in this are PW6 and PBR24. Now often I see this color, it's uh, like a uh, PY42 and then I may have some white in it. Um, I've also seen this as just PBR24, but it's really light like that. Like Core has a really pretty Naples yellow. Very similar to this, maybe a little more earthy. Um, but I'm wondering if they might use PW4 instead of PW6 because they don't need to disclose PW4 in their in their mixes um, because it's kind of it's not really an opacifier. It's kind of more of a filler. Um, but I'm not really seeing a ton of opacity. There's a little bit, but it's not bad. A lot of these colors are single pigment, and on the single pigment ones, I have put a little star in the corner. This next one is Lemon Yellow PW3, which is a Hansi Yellow, Hansi Yellow Light. Now this one, I've always thought of this color as a really light fast color, but um, there's been a lot of uh, controversy about that. And I was listening to an interview with Mark Golden from the Golden Paint Company, who said that um, they always do their own independent light fast testing. I'm just going to kind of pull out a little bit of that color on the bottom. 
And they've found over the years that PW3 has become less light fast in batches. So some sort of uh, difference in the pigment. I don't know. I'm not sure if PW3 is something they mine or synthetic. I would think it would be synthetic for how bright it is, but um, I don't know. But anyway, it's become less light fast over the years. I also wonder if environmental if environmental uh, issues might have something to do with that. Now this one, I love my cadmium yellow, my cadmium colors. Not everybody does. This is cadmium yellow PY35, cadmium yellow light. I'm actually gonna, just going to rinse that, grab a little water to pull that down, the rest of that down with a little bit. Nice and strongly pigmented. Just blotted off a little bit of that water. Beautiful color. I like cadmium yellows. I I know the big trend is the cadmium free products. I think I got a little bit in the neighboring palette, so I'm just going to lift that out. Which is another cadmium yellow. It's cadmium yellow medium, which is also PY35. You can get different colors from the same pigments, just based on how finely you grind them, or if you apply heat, things like that. I'm going to clean my brush and just pull that color down the rest of the way. No issues reactivating these, which is nice. I am so glad that these are nice because after the the opaque watercolors that they released, I was really, um, I was really nervous because I've always really liked Paul Rubin's colors and these are their fourth generation and they're supposed to be the highest quality that they've ever done. I like their pan paints a lot, so. And actually, their first tubes that are really hard to find now, I thought those were really good, but maybe they started reformulating them. This is Indian Yellow PY83, a gorgeous, transparent, very transparent warm yellow. I'm just pulling it down with a little bit of water. Smooths out very well, gradiates very nicely. They seem to be quite finely milled. The next one is Earth Yellow PY42. They're kind of your typical yellow ochre color. Very pretty, very actually very transparent for yellow ochre. Gorgeous gradation of color there. Our next color is Transparent Yellow PY150. Sometimes it's called Azo Yellow, or um, I've even seen it, that pigment used for green gold. Um, kind of cool, green leaning, very, very transparent pigment. Very strong. Gorgeous color, great for mixing. The next color we have is Chrome Orange Hue. That is uh, PO62. I don't know what the pigment for a regular chrome orange would be because it's not something I typically see in watercolor. And chrome orange are usually chrome yellow, so maybe it's whatever, maybe it's a mix with chrome yellow, I have no idea, but PO62 is the color here. This makes great greens when you mix it with Viridian. I, I enjoy that color. The next color is transparent orange, PO71. Gorgeous. These, I love how these reactivate. I'm glad they reactivate well. They worked great for straight from the tube. I think I'm probably going to end up, uh, I'm going to end up topping off these paints because I really am enjoying these colors. So I did a one fill and then you let them shrink down and then you can top them up again. You can do it a few times. When you buy paints that have been filled from tubes or filled liquid poured, they will refill them a few times um, because they'll, they'll fill them, let them shrink, fill them, let them shrink over and over again until they get to the top. So that way you're not having these um, kind of concave not fully filled paints. This is Cad Red Light PR108. Semi-opaque. Look at that gorgeous lay down of color. Look how even that is. Boy, these are nice. These are performing very well in swatches. I'm very excited to... I'm just going to pull it down with some water. I'm very excited to give these a try in a painting. Which you'll probably see in this video. Not the painting process, but you'll see the finished painting. Mmm, gorgeous. 
Very well done. I like their other tubes too, though, I've got to say. Uh, now this one is a mix, which I'm not sure why so many companies, especially especially from Asia, like I see it in Korean com companies, I also see it in some European companies, but this Burnt Sienna is a mix of PR101 and PBK9. I prefer a Burnt Sienna that's made with PBR7 in general. I find the PR... 101s to be a little bit um, weak and red, a little too orangey red. So maybe that's why they added the black to it. This is a mix that I see in like Mugello, Mission Gold, and also Van Gogh and Shinhan. So maybe it's a cultural thing. Maybe that's what they prefer for Brentian, or maybe that's what they call Brentian over there. Um, Windsor Newton also uses PR uses PR 101 for their Brentian, and I, and it's very weak in my opinion even in the artist's quality range. So that is quite a red brown. It's not an, it's not an ugly color. It's, um, it's just very, you know, it's very red. It doesn't look like there's much black in there. The next color is Pyrrole Ruby Red PBK 254, 254. This is a very useful color. Oh, that's gorgeous. It's almost like it's actually got more of a cool undertone than other Pyrrole Scarlets that I've used or Pyro Pyrrole Reds. Pyrrole Ruby Red. That's really pretty. It looks like it's going to be a warm red in the pan. You know what it looks like? It looks like um, it looks like Naphthol, Naphthol Crimson, but Pyrrole should be a little bit more um, a little more light fast than Crimson. You know what I'm curious about? I'm going to grab the box. I'm going to see what the light fast rating on that is. Let's see. Let's see. Pyrol Ruby Red. It's got five stars. So let me look at something that I know would have a high light fastest rating. Like, um, oh, let's look at Ivory Black. That should have a good, so five stars. Yeah, that's good. A good light fastness rating. Let me look at something that may have a lower light fast rating, like a, maybe a, Purple, maybe? No, dioxazine's usually pretty good. That's four stars. Uh, I'm trying to find something that would have a poor light fast reading. Maybe May Green would have a poorer one. Well, that's five stars. It's hard to tell because they, they were formulated to be light fast. Hmm. So yeah, it looks like it's it looks like it's pretty good. Um, you could do your own testing, obviously, and double check the pigments and whatnot. But first row is looking pretty good here. I'm impressed. I was impressed swatching them wet even, but it's I like to see how well they reactivate. The next color is Quinn Rose PB19. These reactivate very well. And this has been a week drying in my office that has a, it's winter in Maine, so it's dry, and I run a radiator in here, so that's also quite drying. Oh, that is gorgeous. Look how transparent that is. I'm able to do a gradation because I have the paint on the tip of my brush and I'm using the belly of my brush with water in it to kind of pull down that color and get that gradation so I don't always have to go back in and re-wet my brush. Look how transparent that is. Isn't that pretty? I, I like Quinn Rose a lot. It's a color that I use a lot. So um, that's one I'm a little, I'd be a little particular about. Very nice. I like Paul Rubin's products too. I do want to say that. So I may have a little bit of bias there. I've always liked their products. But when I don't like something with theirs, I also come out and and say as well. The next one is Paraline Maroon PR179. This is a pigment I'm not all that familiar with, to be honest. I was thinking, and I have Paraline Maroon from another company. And I was thinking it was more of like a like a, like a dried blood red color and this one is more it looks almost more like a lizard and crimson so I'm gonna have to do a little research on that because I'm wondering if this might not be the typical pigment for that because it almost looks like PR 177 which is I think somehow really like a matter red it looks more like a matter red let me look at that let me look at that uh tube and see what it has to say. Perlene Maroon has a five star light fastness PR 179. I'm gonna have to I'm gonna set this out so I remember to look look that up. Um, it could be the other company. I think the Perlene Maroon I have might be from Renaissance. So I'm gonna have to just look it up and see. Next one is Venetian Red PR 101. 
Um, this color is very similar to uh, Indian Red and English Red. It just, I think, comes down to where they have dug the pigment from. This is an earth pigment. It might actually be... It's an earth pigment, but I'm thinking it's PR101 and PR102, and one is synthetic and one is natural, if I recall. The other numbers that, you're, that you might be able to make out on my swatch uh, little boxes there are the the, uh, the Paul Rubens numbers, because I'm really hoping that they will eventually come out with reef, with like pans and tubes, which I think they do in China, but um, they don't have open stock here in America. But I have a, I've had an issue where I've contacted them because I bought the large 48 half pan set and um, I think one of the pans was mislabeled. And they so they sent me a they sent me a pan and it was labeled for sale. It was like in its own wrapping and everything. So um, like it wasn't like they just popped it out of a pallet and and sent it to me. They it was it was carded for sale. So they have that. I'm sure it's just very expensive to offer those on Amazon, where Amazon takes such a cut of everything. The next color is Indian Red. So we've got Venetian Red and Indian Red in the same palette. You can even see on my brush how that color uh, is rather opaque. This Indian Red is much more opaque than the Venetian Red. It's also PR101, but also has PR206 in it. That's pretty. That almost looks like it might granulate a bit. I'm swatching on Arteza Expert uh, cellulose paper. I like that paper. It's great for swatching. gives you a pretty good, accurate look. And I often would use the Fabriano Studio 25% uh, cotton one, but I actually like this one better. And this one is done, this swatch here is done on the Dr. P... Oh my gosh. This is done on the Paul Rubens Glitter. A paper which is really fun. It's really fun for like holiday paintings too. If it's going to be something that you'll hold, not put behind glass because then you can see the sparkle. There's, I, I like their cotton papers a lot. Um, I kind of don't want to waste it on a swatch. I want to save them for projects. That's pretty. A little bit more opaque, but not terribly opaque. Um, it looks like it may have a little granulation, but I'm not sure. I'll have to wait for it to dry to really see what it looks like. Sometimes the colors can look like they're granulating when they're wet, kind of settling out and they're not really. So, you know, can't, uh, can't say for sure yet. Uh, Quinn Maroon. This is PV42. And it looks very, very red. But PV19 is also, you know, that looks very red too. Well, that's a pretty color, isn't it? That would be beautiful for botanicals. And quinacridones are fairly light fast, so... Very strong. I uh, need to go back in with water to lighten up the bottom of the swatch. Probably quite staining if it's a quinacridone. So if you do need to go in and fade something, you want to be, uh, you want to be hasty. You want to get in there and do it before it starts to dry, so you don't get hard edges. That's lovely. That's really pretty. The next color is Quinn Violet, which is another PB19 color. And like I said before, your um, you get can get different colors from the same pigment depending on how they treat the pigment. And that's a lovely um, kind of mauve color. That is pretty, isn't it? Or this one reminds me of Windsor Newton's mauve. I want it a little bit darker at the top. Let's see what we can do. That's really nice. I'm definitely topping off this palette. Rosie made the case here. She had shared some paints with me, but I took those pans out and put them with my other granulating paints. And um, so I put those in there. Look at, see how we already have a have a line there? That's what I mean about, like, if you do need to fade something out, do it quickly because these the quinacridone colors stain. So you don't have time to go back in and futz with it and lift it like you would with, like, a sedimentary color, like ultramarine blue or any of your browns. you got to get in there and make your magic happen before it starts to dry on you. Mm, fair. But the, you know what? These are very easy to work with. I wish I knew the price of these. That's that's a, that's one thing that's gonna um, temper my review a little bit is is um, how much these cost because I'm just curious. Uh, you know, I'm curious, but like if these cost this set costs, you know, a hundred dollars, that's great. If it costs three hundred dollars, <laughs> you know, that's you might be able to get a better, more bang for your buck elsewhere. But 
this is this is a really pretty cobalt turquoise. This is PB28. Um, and if you remember, uh, I bought a tube of cobalt turquoise from Lucas because I really liked the... I was running out and I really liked the one that was in my... Um, my 48 pan set and when I got it it wasn't the same pigment number it was it used um, PB28 instead of I believe PB36 or PG36 yeah PG36 it used a, it used a PB28 and it was very chalky and not very nice but this looks really nice this reminds me of the Turner cobalt, cobalt turquoise or Turner turquoise that I really like so um, it is semi-opaque you can see the uh, you can see the color on the stripe there, but there's some really nice granulation starting to happen. And I think the color of it, of it itself is really nice, but we'll see when it dries. We'll see if it looks chalky or not, but I think it looks quite nice. And I can swatch it out next to the Lucas because when I contacted Jerry, because Jerry's Art Ramble where I bought the Lucas, um, and said it was different than the one I had previously, and the pigment numbers didn't match what they had on their website, they just gave me a refund and they didn't want the tube back, so I could actually swatch that out and we can compare it. Um, but looking at it here on this swatch, it's very pretty. Um, next one is Translucent Turquoise, which uses PB16, which is a phthalo pigment. And it is lovely. I've heard it's, uh, sometimes this is referred to as Peacock Blue. And I've heard this is not quite as light fast as other phthalo blues, so just kind of keep that in mind. I think it said four stars on the tube. Oh boy, but it is easy to handle. Look at that. E effortless grant effortless gradation there also I like to swatch paints on not the best paper in the world because I feel like I can see the flaws a little bit better where I might not see a flaw if I'm using arches paper oh this is just effortless to gradiate gradiate is that a word very pretty whoops I got a little too much paint on my brush though I didn't I lost my gradation there Again, it's a phthalo color, just like quinacridones, they're going to stain on you. Pretty color though. Hopefully I don't get a background. I'll just go all the way up with that so I don't get a background. Very nice. Very pretty. Our next color is Cobalt Blue Light, PB28. You know what's kind of funny? Um, I was just looking and I, Blick sent out a big catalog. They haven't sent out a big catalog in a couple of years. Um, and I was looking through and I was looking at the paints and some have, you know, I was looking at the cautionary labels and whatnot and I got to Cobalt Blue. Cobalt Blue Deep had a Prop 65 uh, warning and a cautionary label, but regular Cobalt Blue didn't. And I thought that was really interesting since they're both Cobalt colors. It must be something to do with the concentration maybe, or the, maybe it's how, how they're milled. Maybe it would be dangerous if it was milled to a finer particle size. Um, even though you're not supposed to spray apply any cobalts or cadmiums. I just thought that was really interesting because I typically, you know, they really they really stand out in the catalog, the, the cautionary labels, as opposed to online. And I thought that was really interesting that something with the same pigment would have a cautionary label and another paint with the same pigment wouldn't from the same exact line. That's pretty. I think that's going to have some nice granulation to it on this paper. I also feel like I can see more granulation on a cellulose paper versus a um, versus a cotton paper. Our next color is Azure Blue Hue, and this is a mix of PW4, and it's got PW4 as the first ingredient, which is weird. They don't need to disclose that, but they did. And then the second color is PB15 colon 3. So let's see what we get here. That... Uh, that's strange. First of all, I don't really see any opacity. P PW4 is not very opaque. It's more of an extender, but this color is very vibrant. I'm going to see if I can get a little bit of that extra pigment out so I can gradiate it a little bit better. Hmm, that's interesting. I don't see any chalkiness. We'll see when it dries, but I've seen the Azure Blue done before with Cobalt Blue and, um, and White, and it's an awful mess. It's, it's not vibrant. It's just chalky and gross. The Phoenix Azure, I think it was called Azure Blue. No, maybe it was Verdeder. Verdeder, is that right? Blue? Anyway, um, I don't see traces of filler there, but it says it's got PW4 as a first pigment, so maybe that's a typo. Because um, it looks really nice and clear to me. Anyway, it looks like a phthalo blue. 
The next one is Berlin Blue PB27, which you may recognize as Prussian Blue. So let's see how this looks. Ooh, that's gorgeous. Look at that. Oh, beautiful, transparent. I have a fondness for Prussian Blue. Um, it's such a classic color, and I was trained very traditionally in watercolor, and Prussian Blue is a color we used. And I still like to use Prussian Blue in oil paints. Really pretty. Let's get a little bit more at the top. Lovely color. So they're calling this Berlin Blue. Maybe because uh, Prussia was part of Germany, and um, maybe it is where Berlin was. I don't know. That makes sense, though, doesn't it? Um, maybe they put Prussian blue in a translator and Berlin came up. <laughs> I don't know. The next one is French blue, which you will know is ultramarine. It's PB29, often called French ultramarine if it's uh, a little more granulating and a little more purple leaning. Effortless grad gradation, even without adding water, adding extra water, I should say. I'm going to add a little bit more. I'm going to go with a little more blue and see. Maybe not the strongest ultramarine blue I've ever used. I use ultra I use ultramarine a lot, so I'm another one I'm kind of picky about. But the color is clean and, and beautiful. It doesn't seem as strong as uh, well. This is they're calling it French blue. Uh, I would imagine they mean French ultramarine, but yeah, it's pretty. It doesn't feel super duper strong, and I think it's maybe milled a little finer finer because I'm not seeing any texture. Well, I am seeing a little texture. I'm not seeing a ton right now. But we'll see how that um, how that dries. I did check on the Paraline Maroon. It is PR 179, light fast color, and it is a deep intense, uh, could be dull red. It had good marks. The PR 206 is actually a quinacridone maroon that's mixed with the PR 101 in the Indian red here, um, which is funny because that's quin maroon there. That's what they've called it, but it is uh, PB 42. Anyway. Uh, also, that seems to be a very top, uh, I think it was a top 40 pigment on handprint, so very light fast, so no no problems there. They definitely have done their research to make sure they've got more light fast pigments in this versus some of their, um, their other paints. Actually, I've been pretty happy with their pan paints, to be honest, so I don't know. I'm, I'm liking this. Uh, oh, look at the, as that's drying, that's really got some nice granulation to it. Not as much granulation in the in the ultramarine, the French blue there. So probably not, probably more of like if you want a traditional paint rather than like a super granulating set, because these aren't super granulating. I kind of wonder how much life that fad has left in it. Anyway, we got Brilliant Blue next. Uh, Brilliant Blue Violet is a mix of PB29, which is ultramarine, PB23, which is dioxazine violet, and, um, oh, that's it, those two colors. So this should be a subtly granulating bright blue-purple. And we are in screen, all right. Oh, that is pretty vibrant. Wow, look at that. I guess I didn't need that much on my brush. Let me rinse some of that off so I can radiate it. That's really vibrant. Already starting to stain. Oh my, that is such a strong color. A little dab will do ya. Oh look, it already stained just in that, wow, just in that second for me to go and get some water. Wow, I already have a line there from the staining. That is a strong color. Pretty though, very vibrant. All right, next we have dioxazine violet, which is just the PV23. Looks very similar to the other one, but just a little bit redder. I like to use dioxazine violet for shadows because it's so dark and so transparent, but it can take things over because it is so strong. As you can see, it already. Yeah, I mean, like, you can hardly see the black line because it is, um, this is such a dark value color, but that's what makes it great for shadows. Dark and transparent, it's not going to make mud. I have it in my travel palette, and you know what? I put it in there, like, four years ago, and it's just a half pan, and I've never had to refill it because it's so powerful, and you don't need much. Um, you certainly get some value for your money with that color. The next color is Indithrone Blue, PB60. 
Um, I apologize if my voice gives out. I kind of feel like I'm coming down with something, which is not good because I'm supposed to teach a class at the library tonight, so I guess I'll be uh, seeing how I feel and masking up. I'm hoping it's just dried air. Indithrone Blue is a beautiful alternative to indigo. It's a single pigment color. The downside is, I believe, it, to me, it always seems a little bit dull. So we'll see how this one, how this one looks. Staining. You can see I've already got a line there just from where I stopped to get some water. So if you are dealing with some of these staining colors and you want a soft granulation, you may wish to pre-wet your paper. I'm going to go in with a, a little more paint and kind of work it down to the wet area. It's a gorgeous, it's a gorgeous color, but you definitely have a big shift from uh, wet to dry. It just go, it just goes dull. Um, it has, I have this in several different brands, and that's something I've noticed. Although, looking at my, dr ooh, my dry swatch here, oh, and I just got water on it. I'm going to either laminate this or put it in a clear bag. Um, it is quite vibrant, actually, in the dried down state, so... Maybe I'll like this one. I did not like the Blick into Throne Blue. That was, and that's the only Blick watercolor I've tried. Um, Lucas I like a little bit better, but still it's not like... It's never going to be a favorite color of mine. And I think it's just the pigment. Um, I did get some Utrecht watercolors to try. I need to get on, on that and get that reviewed. Those reviewed soon. Maybe they will be up before this video. I'm not sure. But a generous viewer put some uh, pans out for me, which is really nice. Um, so this is indigo, a mixture of PB15 colon 1 and PB66. So a mixture of uh, indigo, PB66 I believe is indigo, and PB15 one is a phthalo blue. That's a lovely color, very um, slightly green undertone, um, a, a blue-green undertone I would say, but... Uh, kind of grayed down, desaturated with a little bit of green in it. That might be really pretty in some washes. I'm noticing some weirdness on the bottom of this paper. So I think I might have a little bit of damage to the bottom, to this bottom edge. I think the sizing might have gone off on the bottom of this paper. I had this stored in the room of hordes, so maybe, stored in the room of hordes, so maybe it got a little bit of a moisture there. I'm not sure. Um, but I'm, I'm noticing some sizing issues, so I don't want that color your impression of this last row of paints because I'm, I'm noticing I'm noticing something there. Um, guess it's time to use up that paper and maybe trim off that bottom row. Okay, next one is May Green, and that is a very vibrant kind of spring green. It's a mixture of PY151 and PG7. Very much like the color permanent green light. Oh, that's pretty. That's really easy to use. Grad gradiates really nice. Quite transparent. Very pretty. I used to use a color. I used to use permanent green light a lot in my florals. I don't know why I stopped, but I used to use it a lot. Very pretty. Probably because you can't get such a value range by just watering it down. It's, it's already a really light value, so you know, you're, you're not going to get super dark. I guess I probably prefer a little bit more. If I'm working with limited palettes especially, I prefer a little bit more of a value range in a color. Well, this one's pretty. This is sap green. This is more like a permanent green, um, just a plain permanent green or permanent green deep. This actually also does look kind of like Winsor Newton sap green, which is not my favorite. It's a pretty color, but when I think of sap green, this is not what I think of. What I like for a sap green is a mix between a phthalo green and an orange, quite frankly. And I think they have some verge, some greens that are like that that they call it in their olive green range here in this set. This one is rather weak. I think it would be pretty to use in some florals, but uh, yeah, and you could always desaturate it with you know add a little bit of. Um, you know, leave Venetian red to it and desaturate it a bit if you want to. It's not what I would go for thinking sap green, but it does look a lot like Winsor Newton sap green, so if you like that, I think you'll enjoy this color a lot. In fact, some of these colors really remind me of Winsor Newton. Maybe they're using some of the same pigment, um, the pigment stores or pigment manufacturers. Alright, our next color is Oriental Green PG7, which is a phthalo green. 
phthalo green blue shade if you were looking more for a more um, traditional name. This is a staining green, very transparent, very vibrant. I'm going to add a little water. I should have pre-wet this swatch. Yep, I'm noticing something. There's, there's some issues on the, on the edge of this paper, probably because it's been stored in the room of hoard. Or maybe it got, maybe it got damp or something. This is not the strongest phthalo green I've ever used in my life, I gotta say. But it's pretty. Yeah, so this here, pay no attention to these darker lines on the bottom. It's a sizing issue on this paper. The next color is olive green. And that is a mixture of P062 and PG36. P062 is that color right there. And PG36 is Stalo Green Yellow Shade. So it's going to give you a warmer, much warmer tone. Oh yeah, that's really pretty. Really nice. And that's beautiful earthy green. That's almost like your mossy, your mossy green. That's what you'd see for sap green in some companies. Um, olive green dark is a mixture of PO62 and this time PG7. So it's like that and that, which I think would give me, that's a mix I like to do uh, on my own anyway. Although this one looks more of like hooker's green to me than a sap green. Hit too much water there. But they call it olive green dark. I'm going to add a little more color up there because I feel like I had it too washed out. Definitely more of a hooker's green. Not a color that I use all that much. But you know what? It was one that I that I learned on. That was it because it's such a traditional color. I think that one was more popular than sap green when I learned watercolor back in the early 80s. The next color we have is Cobalt Turquoise Dark PG26. Now this is interesting. I'm really curious how this rewets because I think I have this one in my Mary Blue and it is an absolute nightmare to rewet. But this is rich and gorgeous. It almost seems like a bit of a, it, it kind of reminds me of Cobalt Green. I'm gonna have to double check. Maybe, um, maybe it was PG24 that I had in my Mary because this is so different. I mean, it's like the color is very similar, the color undertones, but the application is uh, is nice. This does look like a cobalt green. That's that's pretty. That rewet really well. I'm very pleased. The next color, brown umber. It's a mix of PB15 colon one, which is our phthalo blue, uh, PBR7, which is what you often see for like a, a burnt umber, and PBK9. So why they didn't just use PBR7, I don't know, but let's just see what we get here. Oh, it's a very cool, little bit of a greenish undertone, probably from the Thalo Blue. I'm surprised that Thalo Blue is the first color because it doesn't seem like it's, like it's that influential in this mix. But I definitely can see the black and I can see the undertones of the cooler of the blue in there manifesting as more of a green cast as it gets mixed with the black and the brown, which tend to have more yellow undertones. Hmm. Uh, this reminds me more, I, this is more like a, to me it almost looks more like a sepia than a burnt umber. Or, well this is called brown umber, it's not called either sepia or burnt umber, but look at it dry here on this cotton swatch. It's definitely more of a sepia color. And then last we have PBK9, which has been a mix in the burnt sienna and the burnt umber. And I'm trying to think, was it in anything else? Um, I don't see it in anything else. Maybe I mentioned it, but let's, let's swatch that out. I don't tend to use a pre-mixed black, um, just because I've always mixed my own, but some people like it, and that's why these things exist. I'm not going to shame anybody because they want to use black or they want to use white. I am so over that. I'm so over people shaming other painters for using what they want to use. I used to drink the Kool-Aid. But now I'm like, you know what, life's too short. Do what you want to do. It's a good idea to know how to mix your darks, but if you decide you don't want to, after you learn how, you know what? 
go live your life. Enjoy. Do what you want to do. It's your thing. Do what you want to do. I can't tell you how to mix that blue. It's your thing. Paint how you want to paint. All right, enough of that. That's silly. Um, okay, so let's let this dry and then we'll do a glaze. We'll do, we'll try some lifting and uh, I'll probably do a few paintings between now and then and then I'll have a really good idea of how I feel this paint set is. I wish I knew what the price was going to be because I am really loving these. I hope they're affordable. They should be. They're from Paul Rubens. They've always provided quality and value. We'll also compare them against the pan paints. The pan set of 48. We'll see how many duplicate colors there are and um, and how they compare. So sit tight. I'll be right back. It'll be a while for me, but it'll be seconds for you. I want to pop in here really quick with a couple of things, a little information I just found. Um, that uh, PR-179 there, that's actually a pigment it is perylene maroon, but it's just been discontinued. And also PR206, which is part of the Indian Red here, has just been discontinued. So this is a new line of paints, and I'm wondering if they may have purchased the end stock of some supplies um, because to have two colors that have gone discontinued in their range. Um, which basically just means that a pigment manufacturer has decided not to make that pigment anymore since the majority of the pigments we use nowadays are synthetic. Um, so it's not like they, they run out of them in the mine, it's just there's less of a call from them in like the automotives or plastics industry, so they just stopped making them. Um, something else I wanted to point out, I was looking at the brochure, and there's a photograph in this brochure, and it has um, two people standing next to the blocks sign, I would imagine, in front of the Blocks factory, which is, I think, in Belgium's. In Belgium, that's where Blocks watercolors are made. They're a fine watercolor brand, which I have not used. They're kind of pricey, um, but they have really good reviews. So I'm just wondering if there's some sort of correlation or some sort of um, relationship between Blocks and the fourth generation of the Paul Rubens colors. There is some... Um, some information in this brochure that came in the paint set, but it's it's kind of funny. Um, like it says, these paints may either be include or be free of ox gall, and it talks about these paints being available in pans or tubes. Um, there's 115 colors, 76 of them are made of single pigments. Um, they're available in both solid pans and tubes, as well as two distinct varieties to accommodate the needs of different painting techniques. So I don't know if they're talking about the fourth generation paint being in tubes or pans, or if they're saying these are the tubes and they have the previous pans. I don't know, but it's been really hard to find the artist grade Paul Rubens tubes, with the exception of like the fluorescence and the um, precipitated ones online. So maybe they're just kind of like getting rid of those, uh, getting rid of those standard colors and replacing them all with the fourth generation. Um, and it does say. Durable pigments are what Paul Rubens prefers to use instead of the less expensive ones. In this case, PV1 and PV3 are never substituted for PV14 in the process of producing a shade of purple. The cost of PV1 and PV3 is just one-fifth of PV14. PW6 and PV29 and PV15 are not used in formulation of PV28 cobalt blue. Uh, so I think they're trying to say they're not using the cheaper, less light-fast pigments to create their paint, they're using the um, the more light fast, the more desired, um, higher quality pigments. Um, fine grinding and filling. Paul Rubens Professional Watercolor Paint Set is composed of finely ground pigment particles. They are quite finely ground. That uh, cobalt turquoise has beautiful granulation, but even the granulation is not super chunky. And uh, the granulation in the cobalt blue and the French or the French blue is also not very chunky. So for those that like to avoid granulation, I think this line of paints is going to be nice. If maybe purchased open stock so they can avoid the granulating colors. Anyway, uh, I think it seems like we got four granulating colors here. That one, that one, that one, and that one. Um, but anyway, I think I'll do a glaze swatch on each of these. I'll do a little lift test in the corner. That's pretty boring to watch. I'll just do that off camera. And uh, then I'll be back with my final thoughts. I've done a few just little practice -y things with it, but honestly, I've got to be on. I got to say, I have not liked anything I've painted lately, so I wanted to have some gorgeous, fully done paintings for this review, but I really don't see it happening. I'm so sorry. Um, I am scraping the barrel. I don't know what it is, but I am just very uninspired. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Anyway, I'll be back. I'm also not feeling that great. I'll be back um, in a bit and, you know, wrap this up. Welcome back. Um, my voice is going downhill, so um, I'm going to try to wrap this up as briefly as possible, but um, I just wanted to share a couple little, just little 
exercises I did with these paints. Um, using the watercolor paper from Paul Rubens that they sent, this is the glitter paper, uh, I did this little rose bookmark and I love the way the paints spread, I love the color intensity. This paper is really nice too, I like the glitter especially around the holidays, it's nice to do bookmarks and things like that that you're going to handle because then you see the sparkle. And then with that same paper I also just did a quick little crab. What I was testing with these two pieces is really the flow of the paint and um, I just kind of did a couple swashes of water. I painted a little crab on there and it just let the paint flow and the paint flow is really nice with this. I would suspect that there's ox gall in these paints. I'm actually going to check my email really quick to see if the company responded to my email asking about that. If they haven't, I'll put the information in the video description as soon as I get it. All right, nothing as of yet, but I did just email them. It hasn't been that long. Um, but great flow, great color mingling. I don't find that this wants to make mud. And I did use colors that were more earthy. I used like the Indian red, Indithrone blue, Naples yellow. Um, I think I used Venetian red. So very dull colors, cobalt, uh, the turquoise color. Um, so yeah, I, I think those stayed quite vibrant considering I started with pretty... Um, pretty desaturated colors and I just love the way that they um, that they flowed together and these are on some cellulose paper these are on the Arteza expert paper and I was just kind of playing around with them because I knew the edge on one of my on the um, expert paper was starting to lose its sizing so I'm like well I'm just gonna fool around with this again just just seeing how they do wet into wet just playing around I really love the way the colors just blend and work together although these paintings aren't very good um, I also was curious about, remember that, I don't know how long you've been watching my channel, but um, I ordered some Lucas paint because I loved the, the paint that was in my Lucas pan set and they changed the pigment color though. So this is PB50, PB, PG50, I think, um, the old Lucas color. This was the new one, PB28, and that's the same color as the... Um, as the Paul Rubens but so I was curious to see that's the same pigment as that but this looks so much more vibrant that looks so chalky um, and even the older one the older Lucas one that I really liked it's not I don't like it as much as I like the new Paul Rubens one so definitely very vibrant colors here you can see the swatch I think I showed you all those I'll move this out of the way you can see the swatch that has all of the colors from this 36 set sent out. I don't know the price of these yet. I did email the company to ask if they knew what they were going to be listed at. Because um, they have to import them, get them situated at Amazon, and then they can't list them for sale until they're actually in the warehouse. And they're accounted for by Amazon, I guess. It's, it takes a while. Anyway, um, I did, I, I just tried lifting with a, I used a synthetic half inch brush to go in and try lifting on the corners. Some colors lifted, some didn't. I found that overall these probably stained a little bit more than other watercolors. Um, and I think that's because they're they're milled quite finely. And uh, let's see, then I did the glazing. They glazed beautifully, which isn't a surprise since they didn't lift as easily as some. I mean, they're typical, you know, ones that lift out good, lifted out good. But, um, but you know, sometimes you can get even staining colors to lift out a little bit more than that. But I, you know, I don't, nothing, no red flags here. Everything looks good. Um, the colors that have a little opacity are not surprising. The cadmiums, they're always going to have a little bit of opacity. Um, the Naples yellow here has PW6 in it, so obviously it's going to have a little opacity. The um, Indian red, that's, that's normal for PR 101 to have some opacity. And then, of course, cobalt turquoise, so cobalt colors will tend to have opacity. Um, I thought it would be fun to compare this to the Paul Rubin set of 48 half pans. I purchased that um, over a year ago. I never got around to reviewing it because I'd reviewed their smaller set of pans. I do intend to. I just, eh, you know, life got busy. Anyway, I bought it for my own, uh, my own enjoyment because I, you know, I have reviewed the smaller sets before. So let's just do, let's compare a little bit. I did notice that... The colors are a bit different. I think if you, you know what? I think if you had this set, you might enjoy getting the tubes to refill it as it as you use the colors up. I think that the 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 first version half pans, which I've liked, I've liked quite a bit. Um, they do seem to be a little bit more chunky. Like if you look at, uh, like you can look at the sky blue, which is a cerulean PB thirty six. It's got some good texture there. We don't have that color equivalent here. 
Well, you know what? I'd say the ultramarines are pretty are pretty similar, milled wide. This is this French blue is almost like a, a ultramarine blue deep, and that one's more of a um, a light. Uh, the cobalt is a little bit more opaque, it seems. I guess the the ones from the half pans definitely seem just a touch more opaque, and it's probably just the milling. Like these are these seem a little bit smoother, and also I think that there might be more binder in the half pans because. I can see like shiny spots on some of my glaze swatches and I don't have any shiny spots in the glaze swatches from my um, my liquid, my tube paint that I put into half pans and dried down. So that's kind of nice, especially if you like to do a lot of gla layering or you glazing and layering and you want to lay something down thick, you're not going to have that shiny issue. But they seem like they're perfectly well bound, I didn't, there's no chalkiness to them. Um, it's really hard to compare these on big sheets like that. Uh, but we can do the things that are similar to the same pigments, like the dioxazine violet there is the same as dioxazine violet here, same pigment. Not exactly the same hue. Uh, Brilliant blue violet and their royal purple are very similar in hue, but they do use different pigment information. This is PB29 and PB23, and this is PB19 and PB29, so that's a little bit different. Um, let's see, that violet, PV19, do we have, uh, that one's pretty close, that to that. I just find, like, that the, um, that the tubes were a bit smoother. I like them both, uh, but I think if you're going to do something where you want more flow, you want your paints to move a little bit more, if you're just trying to decide between the two, I would go for the tubes if you want more flow and if you want more lifting ability. Um, if you want more colors and you want the convenience of having them already in half pans with a palette, then the half pan set would be the way to go. I don't know what these are going to cost. I wish I knew what they were going to cost because it would be so much easier for me to compare these sets. This set, the 48 half pan set, runs around 80 bucks for 48 colors, which is really a steal when you're looking at artist quality paints. Um, so I'm assuming these are going to be similarly priced. I would say that this set here, with these 5 ml tubes, I would say, you know, I consider 5 ml tube, even though like you can see I filled these pans, I could fill them again and let them shrink down. I could probably fill half pans twice, like it, to get the equal amount of paint. I would, so I would say a half pan is probably equal to two, or one tube is equal to two half pans. Um, I would say if you could find this set for under $100, I would think it was a really good deal, personally. There's nothing in this set that makes me feel like they're not as good as other brand name artist grade watercolors. The only thing I'm not as keen on with these is, and I don't know, maybe you'll be able to buy open stock and you won't have to take the sets as they come. Oftentimes sets are a lot cheaper, so even if there's a couple colors you don't like, it's not the end of the world, you're getting a good deal. I'm not crazy about the earth tones. It's the same complaint I have about Winsor & Newton. I'm not crazy about the earth tones, but their other colors overall are really nice. I love the strength of the colors. I love the fine, the, the fine milledness. If you dislike granulation, um, which I almost feel like there might be a pendulum swing, uh, swing to go to more sheer, transparent, non-granulating colors because the heavily granulating colors have been so popular that it almost seems like we're due for another switch. Um, these are for you because even the ones that granulate aren't granulating as aggressively as ones from other brands. Like your ultramarine blue is actually relatively smooth, and so is your cobalt blue. That cobalt teal does have some cobalt turquoise does have some good um, grit to it. But even like the cobalt turquoise dark, that is remarkably smooth for a cobalt color that tends to granulate. And I was looking at this in um, it was one of their other lines. I don't think it is it in this one. Yeah, it's in this one here. Um, the color is quite a bit different. This cobalt uh, turquoise dark uh, that's in the tube set is more grayed, um, more gray, more yellow than the cobalt turquoise deep from the pan set, which is much more greeny colored and uh, more textured. Um, so if you prefer the granulation, go for the first generation pans for sure. Now looking at the brochure that came in the set, um, that part where it said these may or may not contain oxgall, it's making me think that maybe their pans don't contain oxgall and their tubes do contain oxgall, because that would kind of make sense. Um, especially if their pan, the pans they're referring to are these and they are 
the ones we've been using, they don't flow a ton. They're definitely more reminiscent of your Asian watercolors. These act much more like a Western watercolor. And the little picture here in the brochure where they're standing, the two, uh, I think they're two scientists that might have been in the previous brochure looking over a machine. Um, and the picture's too small to tell, I can't tell. But I did look in really close and see that says Blocks, which is a, um, a high quality European paint maker, Danish, I think. I said it, I said it in another clip. But anyway, um, so it makes me think that maybe they did some training or maybe they got some pigments from them or something. But these definitely are a little bit more Western in feel. So if you prefer that finer milled, the heavier flow, um, the no shiny spots in glazes. Now, I mean, if I really look, I could see maybe a little bit of a, of a more luster there, but it's not anywhere near as shiny as like, like here, it almost looks like a Gansai paint, the, the amount of shine there. Um, so I think it just comes down to your preference and of course what the price is going to be. Um, I, I, Paul Rubin stuff has always been very competitively priced. I can't wait to find out what these cost because I say if that set is under a hundred bucks, it's a wonderful value. The packaging is always beautiful. There was no binder separation whatsoever in any of these tubes and uh, they all panned really well. In fact, I'll probably give these another top off before I put this away and um, hopefully we will be able to get open stock tubes of these because boy that's good that's would be really wonderful that would be the thing that would push Paul Rubens up into the same level as Windsor Newton, Daniel Smith, uh, Da Vinci, any of the companies that we know and love, M. Graham, where we can go and buy a single tube of paint. Right now their biggest hurdle is they're only available on sets occasionally on Amazon and um, their previous tube sets have been wonderful, but then they sell out and they, they've never to be seen from again. So I like them. I really like them a lot. I can't wait to find out what the price on these are going to be. But uh, for now, I think they're wonderful. So there you have it. If you have any questions, you can let me know in the comments below. If I've got any more information on these since filming, I will put that in the video description. So please check that first. And then if your questions aren't answered, then let me know. And uh, I'll have links in the video description. Thanks for watching. Until next time, happy crafting.